Welcome to the Pandaverse. Today we welcome Alabama's own Benny Sims, author of Code Gray. He'll be doing a reading for us and uh, we'll have a question and answer afterwards. Uh, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what the book's about and then we'll jump right into reading. Okay. Um, like you said, I live in Alabama. Uh, originally born in Tennessee, raised in Tennessee. Uh, spent about for my high school years, four years in uh, Southern Illinois, Benton, Illinois, and then moved back to Tennessee and then to Alabama for where my job was. And I retired this last November and moved to South Alabama, or we call it here LA, Lower Alabama. So uh, I'm about 20 to 25 miles from the beach, which is not a bad place to retire. And um, uh, as far as Code Gray goes, um, I started writing it uh, 2006, right around those, right around that time. It took me from the time I wrote the first word on my manuscript until it was published was 13 years, a little over 13 years. So it's been a long, it's been a long road. Uh, and it's my first properly published book, so it's uh, it's a big thrill for me. So you've done, uh, some, you've done some other writing previously, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I went to college, uh, majored in journalism at Murray State University. There, go racers. Um, majored in journalism, and I was a newspaper uh, writer and editor for a couple of years. Uh, you don't really make any money in small town newspapers. So I, I took a job uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, with the aerospace company. I worked there uh, for almost 34 years until I retired. But uh, the whole time I was working in this in this uh, manufacturing facility, um, I was writing. You know, everything from little short stories to full-length novels to even tried my hand at writing songs, which didn't go very well. But I was at least writing and. Uh, uh, I guess I've always had a thing for writing, and that's that's why I graduate gra gravitated towards journalism, uh, anything to do with that. I like to read a lot too. So, um, and and Code Gray was just something that I actually did not even intend for it to be a novel at first. I just started writing something uh, that was just kind of on my mind at the time, and then it just kind of grew into this monster i guess you call it uh and it became a book uh and so i went ahead and finished it and tried to uh find an agent or publisher and i had a uh, hundred i think the last count that i had was 146 rejections for code gray which is more than um uh, jk rowling has for her first Harry Potter book. So I got that going good for me. Um, but uh, Panda Moon, uh, you know, I, I agreed to publish it after I entered into a Twitter pitch party, pit to pub is what it's called. And that was going to be my last ditch effort to get it published before I was just going to uh, publish it myself, just do a little self published thing. And I would have ended up selling about 10 copies. Uh, and probably of those 10 copies, probably three of them would have been actually read. Uh, so Panda Boone actually, they, they saved me from a life of continuous self-publishing. So I'm forever grateful for that. Yeah, I have a similar story to, to tell about my, uh, my first, <laughs> first uh, Panda Moon book too. Um, but yeah, you know, I'll save that for another day. <laughs> yeah, okay. What have you got to read for us today? Well, um, I wrote, when I originally wrote this, uh, I had a prologue, you know, prologue and then an epilogue at the end. Um, the prologue actually got cut from the final manuscript uh, during, the, during the final editing. Uh, and it's very short. It's a very short uh, prologue. So I'm going to read that. Uh, and it kind of, it'll give somebody, uh, people who have already read the book or are about to read the book, it'll give them a little bit of extra insight into part of the story. So here we go. Prologue. 
He worked the second shift, the graveyard shift, and he absolutely hated it. But now he was on his way home. It had been a boring night, two speeders that he let off with a warning and one drunk and disorderly at a convenience store. He spent the rest of the evening driving around, doing nothing. Sometimes nights like these seem to last an eternity. His dashboard clock showed 12.15 a.m. as he pulled into his driveway and killed the headlights. He let out a slow exhale of relief. In less than five minutes, he would be easing under the sheets to cuddle up with Laura. She would be sound asleep, having put Zach to bed just after dark, before she made her way to bed around 10. She was a morning person. He was a night owl. Somehow they managed to make it work out. They were a typical young American couple living in a tiny starter home, working odd hours, doing what they had to do in order to get where they wanted to be someday. These weird shifts were all a part of paying their dues. He closed the door without a sound and took a look around. No moon, no wind, no noise of any kind. All the houses around his small two-bedroom rental were dark. The whole neighborhood was asleep. It wasn't called the dead of night for nothing. He opened the front door and pushed it shut with a barely audible snick so he wouldn't wake Zach and Laura. He relied on his memory to make his way through the darkness of the living room. Two steps to get past the door side table, then one step to the left to move past the end table beside the couch. He was just beyond the table when he stumbled and fell over something. On his knees, he felt along the floor and found what seemed to be a drawer lying next to the couch. Normally it would be in the small desk against the far wall, 15 feet away. What was it doing here in the middle of the floor? Laura was a neat freak. She never went to bed unless the house was tidy. He reached up to turn on the lamp that should have been on the table beside the couch, but it wasn't there. And he felt his pulse speed up. He stood up and felt his way through the living room toward the kitchen. Papers rustled under his feet. He stepped on something soft. He nearly tripped over another object on the floor. His heart was pounding as he reached the kitchen. He flipped the wall switch for the light and his stomach turned into a mass of knots. The house was a total wreck. An oak cabinet that held their wedding pictures was turned over. Broken glass was all over the floor. A large picture of Laura and Zach was hanging sideways on the wall. Paper was scattered everywhere. Laura, he yelled. He pulled his gun from the holster at his hip and ran for the bedrooms, turning on lights as he went. Laura! He ran for their bedroom. The door was open, but he couldn't see inside. He swiped at the wall until he found the light switch. The bedroom was just as torn apart as the living room. The dresser was turned over, Drawers were emptying on, onto the floor, and the bed covers were pulled almost all the way off. Laura wasn't there. The panic dug at his chest. Laura, he was screaming now, Laura. He ran for the baby's room just a few feet down the hallway. He switched on the light and found Laura sitting on the floor against Zach's tiny bed, holding the boy against her chest. A small red spot was on Zach's back, and a huge red stain covered the front of Laura's shirt and lap. Her head was leaning back on the bed, her mouth open as if she had frozen in place while inhaling a deep breath. No, he screamed as he fell to his knees. No, 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 no. Tears flooded his eyes as he reached for his wife and son, not knowing where to touch them, but wanting to pull them into his arms, hoping that his embrace would wake them up. But deep down, he knew they weren't going to wake up. They had both been shot through the heart by the same bullet. Someone shot Zach in the back as Laura held him against herself, and the bullet went all the way through his body and into her heart. Their skin had already turned a faint gray. Their lips were purple. He screamed at the ceiling until he had no voice left, and then he fired his pistol at the bedroom wall until the magazine emptied, shooting at the imaginary ghost that had taken his family away from him. When that offered him no relief, he threw his pistol through the glass of the bedroom window and collapse on the floor. And that's the prologue that didn't make it. So. Wow. Wow, you almost made me cry. That's like incredibly well-written. Good job. Well, thank you. 
very well written. Oh my goodness, so many emotions. That was wow. great. Well, that uh, that that was that was left out uh, because uh, uh, those details come out later in the book. Um, actually, in a couple of different places within other chapters. Uh, so we ultimately decided that it would be a better read to leave that out. It would actually be a little bit of a tighter story. Um, and actually that, that little scenario is a little bit confusing because there's two characters in the book that are, that have very similar family tragedies. And if you notice, I didn't mention any names other than Laura and, and his son. I didn't say who he was. I'm not going to tell you either. Uh, you have to read the book, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that ultimately we decided that other than the it being a little bit confusing, uh, it would make a tighter story, so we left it out. Yeah, that happens. That happens sometimes in editing. I uh, yeah. <clears throat> I used to uh, write prologues for things, and I don't. I don't think any of my books have a prologue. So, you know, they usually get cut in editing, but I find sometimes that's, that's just how you creatively start putting together the story is yeah. you write a, you write a story and, and you're really writing it for yourself, you know, so that you yeah. understand what's going on as a background. So, uh, yeah. You know, for all the writers out there, when an editor tells you something's not necessary, you probably need to listen to them. Uh, hey, I have to agree. Yes, Tony. Hey, Benny. So, um, you know, I read the story now. One day is going into the next, so I can't. I don't even know how long I've been sitting here. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, what I was, I was curious of your uh, inspiration. What, um, other than the daily events that were <laughs> going on, you know, what what inspired you to write uh, the character and the, you know, the sort of the main the main character and the, uh, the scenario that you've got? Um, well, you know, it, the book is politically based a little bit, uh, you know, because on the cover it says elections have consequences. Um, and I, I started writing it, like I said, in 2000, I think it was six, five, 2005 or six. I, I can't remember exactly when I started, but what prompted me to start that, to, to start writing, that type of story was, if, if you remember the 2004 presidential election, the swift boat veterans for truth yeah. that kind of came out against John Kerry. Uh, and, and I just kind of, you know, fiction writers like to ask, what if? And, and I just got to thinking, well, you know, what, how far would somebody really go to affect an election? And, and I you know, kind of tried to think of a scenario and, you know, I'm a former member of the media, so I use members of the media getting murdered as kind of the, uh, the backdrop of this book. Uh, and my character, Bodie, um, I didn't want him to be uh, this typical um, he-man, badass type of FBI agent that you, you know, you just see too many of guys like that, that are you know, just a big wrecking ball uh, that can overpower anybody and or, or expert shots and, and all that. I just wanted somebody who was just a regular guy and maybe used his, his wits a little more than his brawn. Um, so I, and I, I didn't, um, didn't pattern him after anybody in particular. He was just a totally made up character. Uh, and I have a few other characters who are loosely based on, uh, either real life people or maybe a TV character or something that I've seen. Um, but Bodie was really not patterned against anybody. I tried to just wanted to make him just a, a, a unique person as much as possible. Yeah. So the story, um, the story has a, a bit of um, contemporary uh, feel to it, you know, with, um, how everything is getting pushed to the extremes in our election processes lately, you know, in, yeah. in the, uh, in, in the U S and, you know, a lot of people watch the news and 
probably think that, you know, these people are, are against uh, their favorite candidate or they're for their favorite candidate or whatever, uh, with the biases and everything. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of disturbing because, you know, I, I know when I was growing up, you, you probably remember it too, that, you know, you had friends that were, you know, of different political ideas and, you know, you might, you might go out drinking or whatever, you might discuss politics, but, you know, it didn't end your friendship. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think we've lost a lot not being able to, um, to discuss, you know, the issues with one another, with one another. And it seems like our, our entire yeah, government is. has disintegrated to two camps of thought. And yeah. the, the sad truth is, I, I believe most of the country somewhere in the middle and don't, don't agree with either side completely. Yeah. And, and, and I totally agree with that. Um, but what gets me is I, when I started writing this in 2006, and here we are in 2020, you know, and, our, and nothing's gotten better. So yeah, yeah things don't change. I, I like to think, yeah, I like to think that maybe I was able to predict the future. So I maybe need to start buying lottery tickets. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But I, I mean, you know, it was it was that bad in the in the early two thousands, and it's even worse now. So yeah, it, it does pertain. The book does pertain to what is happening in in today's world. Yeah. Uh, I also, you know, wanted to include the media because the media is so uh, instrumental in in the way people develop their ideologies a lot of times. Um, and. and Within the last few years, uh, you know, there have been one or two studies that have shown that uh, people watch the news not to not to learn something or to be informed, but to verify their own beliefs. So they yeah. pick and choose rather than rather than uh, rather than uh, uh, being told what the truth is, they they pick and choose their own truth. They rather than what is actually true, they they just believe in things that they want to believe are true, whether it's true or not. Yeah, they're looking for val validation of their uh, their own ideas and their own beliefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah, I agree with that. So, uh, so anyway, um, and, and you know, with me having a, a media background, that's that's yet another reason why I just included members of the media uh, in this. Now. Uh, to be fair, most of the people, uh, uh, victims, I guess you'd call it in, in the in the book, are not what you would call hardcore journalists. They were more of an opinion type uh, media personality. Uh, you know, one had a was a talk, or a couple of the guys were talk radio hosts. Uh, there was a woman who was an author. Uh, you know, people like that. Uh, rather than somebody who sits behind a, a news anchor desk and reads the news, that that's not what I wanted. I wanted somebody who, who were clearly in one ideological, you know, lane, left or right. So, and uh, and it, I actually intended on having m many more victims, but after it got to about four people, uh, you know, I thought that's enough bloodshed. Uh, books getting long enough. I kind of need to start wrapping this thing up a little bit. So, so you're not you're not thinking like Stephen King here, you know? <laughs> no, no, I can't. That, I don't know how he does it. I love Stephen King, but I just uh, the finished book was about it was it was well over a hundred thousand words. It was a uh, hundred and eight thousand words, and Stephen King writes in a hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand. That's a uh, that's a lot of, lot of writing. I mean, it took me however many years to write the book just to do a hundred and something thousand words. So I don't think I had enough energy. Yeah. But now, now you, now you've, uh, you've gone through a lot of the trial and error. So the second book won't, uh, won't take that long for you to write. Speaking of that, is this, do you have an idea for a second book? Is there a continuation to the story? Uh, yeah. Uh, I've got at least three stories in mind. Um, I, I'm currently working on 
I'm putting the finishing chapters on a standalone, not at all related to this series novel. Um, there's a lot more bloodshed in this one, by the way. Uh, but as far as the Code Gray, the, the Bodie Anderson stories, um, I've got at least two more stories in my head. I have started the outlining, loose outlining, and uh, light research that goes along with uh, writing a novel like this for the second novel. And as soon, just uh, probably the day after I finish the novel that I'm writing now, I'll, I'll start writing chapter one of, of the next novel, which I've already got the title. It's going to be called Boom Slang. And um, whenever I finish it, I guess it'll be published uh, a year, one to two years after that. So I guess I need to get it done as quick as possible, don't I? Hurry up, hurry yeah, up. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, as your as your career moves on, you'll uh, you'll grow fans, and they'll be asking, "When's when's the next book coming? When's the next book?" Hey, I've already had a few people. So you're not uh, ask me that. So you're not far from uh, from New Orleans. So no, you and uh, Nola Nash could uh, could uh, team up and write a write a mystery that's set in New Orleans, probably. Yeah, have, I'm just yeah that out there. Have Bodie Anderson travel down to New Orleans to investigate some kind of crime that occurred in a graveyard somewhere. You know that that would. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to talk to her about that. I probably should have. You know, when I lived in in Huntsville, uh, and she lives uh, just outside of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee. It's, yeah, that was, yeah, that's not far away. It's two hour. It's a two hour drive from Huntsville to Franklin. I, we probably should have done that already. But New Orleans, from where I live, which is in I live in Foley. Foley, Alabama, which is almost exactly halfway between Mobile and Pensacola, Florida. Okay. New Orleans is about three hours, about a three hour drive. Yeah. So yeah. On the east side. Mm -hmm. So we may, we may have to do that. Who knows? And you know, speaking of teaming up with authors, uh, Tony, you know, we may have to meet halfway between Vancouver and, and LA and, uh, you know, write us something about, you know, your your ballet dancer character and Bodie Anderson, you know who knows. I yeah, yeah. I, I, you know you you, you could probably <laughs> uh, you probably have a gambling scene in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. That I never happens. Have to does it? <laughs> no, 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 no. no <laughs> Vegas doesn't. Yeah. Vegas doesn't appear in any mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery itself, but that's another right. other topic. It's just because it, it's no mystery what happens to your money when you go there. I yeah, guess, you know, exactly. Well, everybody knows. It stays in Vegas, including your money. Yeah, <laughs> including your money. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I really wish that I was uh, a faster writer. I um, I kind of write in spurts. I don't write every day like a uh, you know a lot of a lot of people do. Um, I kind of write in fits and starts. I'll spend two or three days in a row all day long writing, 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 writing. And then I'll take three or four days off or sometimes as long as two weeks off. Uh, I got to, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Um, and plus I was, you know, with my current uh, work in progress that I've got, uh, I probably would have already been finished with it, but I got really, really sick in January and February of this year. And uh, there's a chance that it might've been that COVID-19, a light case of that. I had something that was, had knocked me down for about eight weeks. And, yeah, I, uh, that, I, that I had, put something, I had something for about a week in February too. But, uh... you know, you know, I think a lot of people did. And, uh, but anyway, that, that, that really put a, a a slowdown on my writing, but I'm starting to pick it back up here. And like I said, I wish I wrote faster. Um, and I probably need to start writing every day a little bit. It will probably help my writing. Oh, and, and, and something else. I, I know uh, you guys probably know this. Well, maybe you do. But if somebody's watching this video for the first time and, and they haven't read on uh, my writing process, um, I went to Key West a few years ago when we went to Ernest Hemingway's house. Okay. Really nice place down, down in Key West. And you talk about an inspiration for writers. Uh, but I learned something about him then that I didn't know is that he wrote standing up. Yeah. Um, 
he had a bookcase that he kept his uh, his typewriter, uh, and and he stood up. All, it was from a, a war injury. He was a correspondent during during war a war time, and he got a, an injury to his leg, and, and it hurt him to sit down for long periods of time. So he stood up. So I thought, you know, I've you know I know some people who do some of their work standing up. So I, I started writing standing up, and it it made an incredible difference in in the quality of my writing. I, I was able to focus a lot more. Uh, I can actually read my writing. And I can tell you whether I was standing up or not just by reading it, uh, because my writing is so much better. Uh, so you know, going to invest in a good stand, a little maybe, stand up maybe desk. That's a, so. Maybe that's a secret for you. I mean, I've, yeah, well, I, it, 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 I've tried standing on my head; that doesn't work at all. But yeah, that's yeah, is I can't read upside down anyhow. So yeah, I totally get it. I can, but, uh, I can read upside down. You know, I I've got dyslexia, so you know, the words jump all over the page. You know, anyways. Dyslexia, all right. Dyslexia, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. But uh, when I started doing that, um, I, I thought, you know, this is going to be the way I have to write from now on, uh, and. I kind of wish I that was something I had discovered when I wrote my first book that ended up, I just self-published it. Uh, the writing in Code Gray and the writing in my first book is, is night and day different. It, it, yeah. Code Gray is a much better, well-written book. Not saying my writing is incredible or anything like that, but it's uh, compared to the first book, yeah, it's a heck of a lot better. So, yeah. you know. Improvements. Well, writing's a writing's a learning process, you know, completely. I mean, I think I think my yeah. my later writing's better than my early writing, but I I think yeah. every, everybody thinks, that. you know, I, I'm yeah. reading other people too. I can see, I can see the evolution in people's writing between their first books and their second books. So, yeah, um, right. absolutely. And I hope that my my next book will be even better. So. The, the object is to improve, you know, make your stories better, make it a better read, you know, keep trying to evoke emotions out of people, you know, like make Christine tear up a little bit, you know, when you can, uh, make Tony laugh out loud sometimes when you can, uh, you know, and if you can do that, then you can hook a reader. Well, you've got a, you've got a, um, wicked sense of humor at times, you know, I, been in some meetings with you. <laughs> you've, you've cracked me up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, I, I came, my family historically have just been a bunch of lunatics, I, you know, uh, all the way into my grandparents' generation. And, and ever since then, we're just a bunch of idiots. And, uh, you know, if we can't laugh, then what is the use? Uh, it's definitely no fun living if you can't laugh. Right. So I try to make people laugh. It's, it's, it's kind of fun for me to do that, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's way more worth that than just sitting around grumbling and complaining all the time, which I, 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 could, I do enough of that too, you know? So. <laughs> I think we all do. Yeah, right. So uh, we got... Any more questions, Tony, Christine? I just had a comment. Um, I think it's really wonderful how you told your story um, because you pr have proven that you can take your time and create something beautiful that you don't have to be in a hurry and you don't have to be in a rush to try to get something published. You know, things will work out um, as, as they will. So I think that your story is wonderful for all of the writers out there that are struggling to get published. Um, you know, it may have taken you a few rejections, but ultimately you accomplished your goal and that's wonderful. Yeah, well, well, well thank you, Christine. That, uh, that's nice of you to say that. Um, I, I will tell you this, the rejections were horrible. Uh, it, it, it is absolutely horrible. And if you want to be a writer, get a thick skin and be ready to handle rejections because they're going to happen. Uh, but I think the rejections ultimately made me a better writer because it let me know that, okay, this, this version that I've got right now that I've just submitted isn't quite 
tight enough. It's not good enough. So let me, let me tweak it a little bit. So I was constantly tweaking this story and I made it good enough to where it caught somebody's eyes. Um, and, and I've been asked before by other younger writers and other online forums and stuff, you know, what's your advice? Uh, the only advice that really that I have to a writer is um, persevere. Do, yeah. Just persevere. Yeah. Never, don't don't never give, up. give up. Never give up. Do not do not give up because keep at it. You will you will get published if you keep at it. But I guarantee you, if you stop, you won't get published. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, there's an old saying: you miss 100 percent of the shots that you don't take. Uh, yeah. so, so keep throwing your stuff out there, persevere, just keep at it. Uh, and, and I followed that, that advice was given to me before years ago and, and I just uh, kept at it and it paid off. Uh, I sure wish it had paid off years ago. Uh, but you know what? I'll take it. I'll definitely take it right now. You know, uh, rejection, I mean, I've said, I've said this before in other, uh, and other videos that we've done, but uh, rejection is uh, a publisher or you know a, an agent or whatever saying that it's not ready yet. Yes. You know it's not. It's not that it's that it's terrible. It's not that it's bad. You know it's just not ready yet. Yeah. And um, as as an author, you may have a sense of of completion when you get to the end of the book. And and you think the story's completely done because you you've been with it completely, and you know all the things that probably you think are in there that aren't really in there yet. And until you go back and read it and and work on the material, it's not ready for somebody to read it that hadn't been inside your head the whole time when you were creating it. Yeah, that that's right. I mean, you know what you're thinking yourself. Somebody else may not, you know, they can't read your mind. Uh, and that's where, uh, you know, you finish a book, get yourself a good editor. And I, Heather Stewart was my editor and oh my gosh, she is so incredible. She, she made Code Gray a much better book in my opinion. Uh, and I, and I, and I give her all the kudos for that. Uh, she wasn't able to read my mind either. And she asked me some questions like, what in the world were you writing here? What was this all about? You idiot. She didn't say that. She she, she didn't yeah. say that. She didn't say she didn't call and, me an idiot. She called, sometimes, me, she called me a dumb. Sometimes you, you read whatever they were questioning. Sometimes you read that passage and you go, "What was yeah. I thinking?" Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah, I've we'll done that myself. Let's go ahead and delete that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've done that myself. I read some uh, some of the stuff that I've written years ago, and I think, "Oh my gosh, what was I thinking?" We think. Uh, like Benny Sims again, the, the title of his book's Code Gray. It's available on Amazon. It's also available from uh, pandamoonpublishing.com. It's, it's eerily descriptive of our current political events. And uh, the fact that you said you wrote this, you know, over 13 years ago is, right. is quite interesting. And we have several books that we've published that fall into that category, really. So. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like I said, I think I can, I think I'm able to, to predict the future. So yeah. I'm, I've got, I'm going, I, if anybody wants lottery tickets, let me know and I'll, I think, uh, I'll get you. I think uh, Penny Jones kind of falls into that category too. Her, her yes. books. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I have to agree. I've read cricket and uh, it's kind of, kind of scary actually. Yeah. Cricket's yeah. real scary. Yep. All right. Thank you. Take care. Great.